Hi everyone. Welcome to today's event, navigating today's tech hiring market and the future of work. We are so glad that you are all able to be here with us today. For those of you who might not know, my name is Emma Jordan. I'm a marketing manager and staffing at staffing and recruiting firm Motion Recruitment, the founder and sponsor of Tech in Motion Event, which is our international tech event series. Tech in Motion was founded with the goal to bring together the tech community, share ideas, and inspire one another. We are so excited today to bring you a panel of experts that can help us understand the current market landscape and what the implications are on the future of work. As the economy and employers seek normalcy amid an ongoing pandemic, headlines about the great resignation, tech talent shortages, and conflicting expectations, sorry, let me catch my breath, <laughs> about returning to the office have flooded our news feeds. The current hiring market is unlike anything we have seen in the past, and it's creating new challenges and opportunities for tech professionals and employers alike. Today, we have the opportunity to dive in and help provide some clarity into these topics and more. Before we go ahead and get into the discussion today, just a few things to go over. As the panel gets started, feel free to submit questions and comments in the chat box, and our panelists will do their best to address them during the event and at the live Q&A at the end. Today's webinar will also be recorded and available on demand after the live session ends. So you will receive a link via email to view the video at a later time if you have to hop off or anything else. Last but not least, don't forget to follow us on social so that you will be in the know of all of our up and coming events and ways to get involved. Okay, now on to the good stuff. I'm so happy to introduce my colleague, Kayla Booth, our moderator for today. She's an enterprise account executive at Motion Recruitment with vast experience in the tech hiring industry, and we are so privileged to hear from her today. Welcome, Kayla. Hi, everyone. So excited to kick off this discussion. I know that um, navigating the hiring market, whether you are looking for opportunities or growing your career or you're actually hiring, um, there's a lot of challenges with that. So I've, I've, sent, I've spent my, uh, my career and the staffing and recruitment space over the past decade. I've worked uh, nationally across the US and globally as well. So looking forward to um, introducing our panelists and diving in on the discussion. Um, and uh, you know, just to provide some context, 2020 uh, was a year that was kind of slow. You know, we never, we, we thought that uh, it was, challenging in many respects, a lot of downsizing and keeping the lights on business as usual. And with 2021, we're, uh, we're approaching Q4 and it's going by at lightning speed. So excited to dive in on the state of hiring right now as, as well as what's coming up for this year. And without further ado, I'm excited to introduce our panelists. They all come from unique backgrounds and um, I will start with Jake Rosenfield. He's the professor, professor of sociology at Washington University. Jake, can you share a little bit of background about yourself and, and what brought you to where you are today? Uh, sure, thanks Kayla. Uh, delighted to be here as the kind of non-tech representative on the panel. Um, I'm a professor of sociology here at Washington University and my research studies compensation. Basically the core question I'm interested in is uh, why do we get paid what we get paid? And from that, kind of uh, extrapolating what the future might hold in these uh, really unsettled times. So I'm excited. Wonderful, yeah. T tech and uh, salaries and compensation is a topic we will definitely be diving in on more. And um, next we have Phil Perkins. He's the Vice President at Motion Recruitment. Phil, can you share a brief introduction as well? Sure, yes. So uh, as Kayla said, I'm Vice President of our uh, agency staffing business line here at Motion Recruitment. Uh, I sit out personally, I live in the greater Boston area and oversee and work out of our Boston office, but I've worked out of our Chicago office and run a team there. I've run our Los Angeles region uh, and I currently oversee uh, Atlanta as well. So definitely have experience hiring tech talent across the country and excited to share some of my thoughts today. Wonderful. Yeah, I'm, those are all hot markets and, you know, we can dive on more uh, about regional and, you know, with the remote workforce. But to give a 
a quick run through of our top five topics we'll be covering today. Um, first, we'll be covering the immediate impact of salaries and compensation with the, uh, the current uh, tech employment status. And next, we'll be covering the debate around the hybrid workplace, which comes into play with compensation, obviously. Um, and the third topic we'll be covering is navigating the tech talent gap, which is increasing more and more. And one of the primary reasons why hiring can be so challenging on either side. Uh, finally, the last two topics is the hiring funnel and the tech employment for 2022 and what to expect. So let's dive in on our first topic. Um, well, to, to set the stage first, you know, with the IT market growth, 4.79 million U.S. tech se sector jobs are exceeding an all-time peak of, de of demand, um, which is up from last year and really all in his history of our, our job market growth in tech. And um, that has a lot of, to do with technology accelerating at a rapid pace, and it's really disrupting across all industries, not just, you know, healthcare or, um, or security supply chain. Um, and, you know, I guess that brings us into, I, I can ask a first question. And I think Jake, this might be a topic that, um, that you can speak to is what's the immediate impact on tech salaries, um, given the the changes that have evolved from 2020 to 2021. Sure. Uh, yeah, thanks, Kayla. I was just actually digging into the data uh, last night. So of the kind of top five growing uh, occupations that the government thinks will grow the most, not only this year, next year, but the decade ahead. Um, well, first, you have things like home health care aides, which is no surprise. But uh, pretty quickly up on that list are software developers, analysts, testers, um, you know, software engineers of all sort, you know, the tech related occupations that we know so well. Um, that robust growth um, means that, you know, given high demand, uh, means that salaries, I think, are going to remain quite high, certainly related to their pre pandemic um, base point. Uh, and that obviously poses challenges. I think it's great news for tech workers who have the skills uh, and are equipped to meet uh, this demand, but obviously uh, there's going to be some adjustments uh, going forward. We know that some of the fastest growing salaries across the occupational spectrum are for tech related jobs. Uh, I can tell you having just uh, taught classes, a lot of uh, the seniors at these universities these days are uh, gaining the experience and knowledge needed to kind of help meet the needs, but uh, there's going to be a great need because the projected growth is, um, is as you said, uh, unprecedented. Absolutely. Phil, is there anything you want to piggyback on that topic? Yeah, you actually, you said something that I think I talk a lot about because I, I actually completely agree with everything you said, but the one thing that I think gets under discussed is if you have the skills to meet the demand. And I think you know, my big thought on the way you sort of pose the question 2020 to 2021, I think 2020 from, I've been doing this for 12, going on 13 years now. And I've, the biggest thing I think was so crazily different was the appetite for risk was so low in 2020 from the individual candidate pool. And they just didn't, they were scared to take around risk because the world was at such a risky state. And I think there was so much pent up sort of risk taking that 2021, not only are there more jobs, but also I just think people are ready to really lever up on that risk taking, which is why I think a lot of the sort of it's like, hey, this is my time to make a big splash and, and get, get a big pay increase and take a chance, which makes sense. And, it's, and I actually agree, it is a great time. But my point as it pertains to the future I think 2022 and 2023, probably even more so, it's going to be super critical that your skills and the depth of your skill set match your, your, pay, your pay range. I think if you got that big pay splash and you kind of sit, sit on your rest on your laurels a little bit, you maybe don't deepen your skills and continue to train and gain mentorship and continue to really excel at your craft that next job search is going to be even harder because people will be scared by that price tag, by that 
sort of salary expectation unless you can back it up and really bring bring the skills that are sort of uh, equate to that pay grade. So that's kind of a, it's a blessing and a curse. And I think if you play your cards right, you can really make that be to your advantage. But I think you'll see a certain percentage of folks that made a move this year struggle to keep that income long-term. Absolutely. You know, I was, I was researching some statistics um, in preparation of this discussion. And I, I saw a stat from DICE that half of technologists think that they're underpaid. Um, and, you know, over the past seven years or so, tenure mm -hmm. hasn't really been a big um, uh, of importance when it comes to hiring. Really, it's more uh, what skills did you work with? And, and a lot of a lot of technologists, they are at the mercy of the employer, right? With the tech stack that they have to use or the, you know, deployment tools that they use. So do either of you have any um, input on tenure and, you know, what it takes to actually get hands-on experience with the hottest technologies? I sure do, but Jake, you can take the floor first if you have something to share. Sure. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, from the employer's perspective, given high salaries right now, uh, and, and just to kind of piggyback on something uh, Phil had said, some of this risk-taking, um, you know, it's an unsettled time in so many dimensions, but some of that risk-taking uh, stems from household finances that really, you know, for the college educated, for tech workers, uh, for kind of the professional class that were really increasing in 2020. You know, we weren't taking vacations. Uh, we, there was a number of government programs that helped out. And so you have that kind of stable base from which to take some risks now going forward. And, you know, to the extent we can predict the future, I like the idea of just looking in the year ahead. Um, I think that will continue. Uh, but back to kind of the uh, point at hand, you know, from the employer's perspective, um, if there's the feeling that they are overpaying relative, then certainly they were uh, uh, pre-pandemic uh, and that they're paying a bit more than they would like to, which I think is omnipresent, um, you know, the kind of on the ground within uh, within firm training uh, to increase tenure, right, to kind of attach that worker to the firm, I think is more is, is more important than in a long time we've seen. The kind of short tenures jumping around uh, is affordable when you're when you're starting salaries are lower, you can afford to lose that worker. It's less affordable when you really have to overpay relative to what you thought you would have. I couldn't agree more. I would say the thing that jumped out to me as far as what I've noticed to be really probably the largest increase if it was just from a percentage perspective, entry level hires and they're out coming out of school with a good computer science degree or, or something similar. I mean, it's kind of crazy. It's like right into the six figure range, like right out of school. And I can say even two years ago, you know, 70 to 90 K was kind of like standard for entry level. And, you know, that's not bad still. And you can still get some entry level folks in that range. But if you're talking about washing, wash you computer science guys or, or girls, or, uh, you know, any of the Ivy leagues or any of the, you know, the top tier CS, I mean, they're immediately six figure kind of well into six figure. And I think exactly what Jake just said is, that's when it's like, you better have your ducks in a row from an entry level training and cultural development perspective and getting them plugged in long term because it's rough to pay, you know, 120K for an entry level employee and have them leave after a year, which happens quite a bit, to be honest. Yep. So um, I would say that area is, it's kind of setting the stage for, I'll be curious to see how companies handle. That, that second job, two, three, four years into the workforce um, and where people come in from a comp perspective and, a, and an increased perspective, because that'll obviously set the stage for how the rest of it stacks up as the, as the years go by, obviously. Can I just jump in there? I, I couldn't agree more, Phil. And another kind of, I think, imperative on the employer's perspective is to think, and I think you're getting at this, about internal promotion possibilities, because, you know, 
it's in tech and, and every industry I can think of, you know, that first year or so, we are not paying off uh, for the firm, right? <laughs> as workers, we are, uh, we are net negative. And so we only start paying off as we get trained, as we get acclimated, as we really uh, kind of develop the skills needed to contribute. And so it's, you know, all the more important for uh, firms to think clearly about how do they retain those workers uh, who have the kind of most uh, productive capacities. Those are some really good points. And that kind of leads into the, the remote hiring, you know, with all the floodgates of, of hiring starting pretty much in April, uh, it's only been increasing and organizations are, are having to look outside, you know, where their headquarters or their offices are in order to hire. Um, I'm interested to hear your perspectives on how organizations are, um, you know, expanding their search and hiring from other locations. Um, it's kind of like the housing market is right now, right? There's a very low supply and a very, very high demand. So what have um, what have you seen, Jake, in terms of employers hiring across different geographies? Uh, sure. I think the first thing I would say, and you know, I might be al alone here, is I think, um, and again, if you start to project out, if we ever get uh, past the uh, current pandemic, I think that uh, the uh, the remote work debate is somewhat overhyped. Already, we've seen a lot of workers return to the office, uh, not so much in tech, but in a lot of other industries. And I think we'll, we'll start to see, although you know the research is still quite early, some of the uh, downsides to having a largely remote workforce. That's going to vary, obviously, depending on the particular job responsibilities. Um, but you know, just this in, in August, the latest data we have, it's just about 13 to 14% of all workers are working remotely. And that's down from 40% in the spring of 2020. It remains higher, remains around 35, 40% in the kind of tech related occupations. Um, on the other hand, you know, kind of counteracting that, we know now from workers uh, that they want greater flexibility. That's become, I think, quite apparent uh, throughout the pandemic. Uh, and so I can foresee a future of some kind of balance in between, whether that's hybrid, uh, whether that's, um, you know, some, you know, kind of core positions in office expectation, you'd show up three to four days uh, a week while others, uh, other jobs that are more easily done remotely uh, can be kind of siphoned off to other locales. Um, I won't go on <laughs> too long on this point that raises a lot of issues about compensation and various tiered compensation structures, but I, I, I'm eager to hear what Bill thinks. Yeah, Phil, what are, what are some of the uh, role types that you have seen that are most open to permanent remote? Um, I find the permanent remote thing, most of our clientele, and I would say most tech companies, are saying for the right candidate and the right job, we're open to it if the candidate wants that. What I'll, and I'll talk a little bit more about what roles and stuff like that. But the one point I think is really becoming more and more sort of omnipresent, if that's the right word, is we have a lot of candidates who are actually choosing, when they have multiple offers, the offer they're going with is the offer that has a, a low physical location near to where they live. Not so much because they plan on going every day, but the idea of never going to an office actually scares a lot of people. And they definitely don't like the idea of never meeting their, their teammates or, you know, and I, I never think engineers will go back five days a week or even four days a week. But I do think that there's a large demand for two days a week, one day a week in the office, not having to get on a plane. Like, so like what I've been saying, like for a lot of our Boston based clients, where I really have a lot of hands-on experience, it's what used to be, 25 miles is now 100 miles. Um, so like if you live kind of anywhere in New England, you can get to Boston once a week pretty easily. And the you know, that's sort of like the new, a lot of the demand we're seeing, or even once a month sometimes. But um, that's one point I just wanted to make. I will say the point you brought up, Kayla, I think is also critical. There are some jobs underneath an engineering org that are much more easily done remotely. If you're an individual contributor coder who's writing a lot of code that's very well documented and you have a strong product management 
presence that gives good direction that you don't really need to like be in those standups in person constantly. It's a lot easier to work remotely, but if you're a smaller startup and maybe you don't have a mature product management org and there's a lot of like very complex architecture where you need to really sort things out, a lot of people really prefer to be in person whiteboarding that and like kind of thinking through mm -hmm. those more in-depth problems. So, you know, I would say general rule of thumb, typically the larger the company and the less your job is dependent on you know, other people's input, the easier it is to be remote, obviously, from an engineering perspective. But um, yeah, does that answer your question? Sorry, I got off on a little tangent there. Yeah, yeah, it does. I guess from my perspective, it might be a little bit different. Um, so challenge me there. But most of my clients that I, I work with, they are bringing folks on contract to hire. So they convert uh, after about six months. And a lot of uh, candidates, you know, they're basically making their decision based on salaries and comp compensation. So we have this, you know, battle for talent and employers are ponying up and throwing, throwing money in order to, to hire because there's not enough folks out there. So um, I hear you guys on the, you know, the remote preference for in the future, but a lot of people are that I've, you know, seen are making a decision based on capitalizing on the current market uh, because, you know, who knows what's going to happen in the next six months. Hopefully everyone's back in the office in the next 12 months, but a lot can happen in a year. So I've seen from my perspective, you know, the remote not really, really being a big issue. It, it's been more on the tech, what actual tech they're going to be working on and the compensation. I would agree, especially on the contract side. I think that ties to our first topic of risk taking and more appetite for risk taking, where I agree there's a lot more people that for the right rate, if the rate is good and it makes sense financially, they are open to comp that type, that the, the contract world for sure. I also think when you hire contractors, it's a lot easier for them to be remote because traditionally that means you've scoped out a project and you're just staffing it. So mm -hmm. I think a remote contractor increase actually does make a ton of sense. It just depends on your needs as a, as a company, obviously. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, I've seen that mostly with, with DevOps and you know engineering, not so much on the project management side where they are whiteboarding and trying to <laughs> drive deliverables. Um, sure. I guess last kind of topic um, before we move on from salaries and compensation, um, just to highlight uh, what we think is going to happen across different geographies um, as we as, as companies continue to hire remotely. So you know, if we're comparing uh, salaries and compensation in Boston versus California, you know, a lot of these. Um, larger cities with tech hubs like New York, they're poaching candidates from Dallas and making it hard for local Dallas companies to hire from there. So do you, uh, Jake, have any perspective there on what's going to be happening in the future? That, I think that's a great question. Uh, there's thorny issues raised on kind of whatever a company does here uh, with regards to compensation and having uh, workers kind of spread out a, a, across locales that vary dramatically in the cost of living. So Google kind of most publicly has been the firm leading the way saying, we will adjust uh, your compensation uh, if you choose to work in lower cost of uh, uh, lower cost of living locales. And, you know, they've, I give them credit for their transparency on the issue. They've released a spreadsheet. It kind of breaks it down how much uh, your compensation will, will likely uh, decrease. Um, what, from what we know about how we as workers in tech and otherwise interpret our pay, uh, that is going to cause some morale issues. Uh, no matter what we tell ourselves or try to rationalize it, our pay is oftentimes tied up in our sense of self-worth and, and it's uh, deeply intertwined with um, our sense of how we're valued by our employer and how well we're doing our job. Uh, so a cut of any sort uh, can lead to workers thinking, huh, I've been devalued. 
Um, and, you know, I've surveyed uh, workers on what they think determines their pay and what they think should determine their pay. And I have to say of a number of factors uh, listed, including, you know, their performance at work, how well their company's doing, cost of living ranks way, way down that list. On the other hand, um, if you're staying in the Bay Area uh, and your colleague who used to work, you know, next to you uh, has moved to Nashville, Austin, right, and on Instagram is showing off their nice new big house with a pool, uh, and you know that they're still making the same as you, uh, despite, uh, you know, different um, cost of living, uh, that raises morale issues on the other uh, on the other end too. So I don't think there's any easy way, given how much kind of equity, what we think of as fair pay. Uh, how large that looms in uh, workers' understanding of their salary. Uh, I think any uh, move by an employer uh, should be also accompanied with a lot of transparency and a lot of kind of outreach to uh, workers explaining exactly why they're doing the move they're doing. Uh, right now, it's a lot of variation. So Google is making those adjustments. Some of its competitors have come out and said, nope, no matter where you choose to work, um, we will pay, we will offer you the same salary. I, I agree with that. And um, we pulled a stat, I think it's on the next slide, but 39% of employees are considering quitting their job if they're forced to go back into the office full time. I mean, that's almost 50%. So um, Phil, what do you see companies doing in order to be flexible? Is it on a case by case basis or, um, you know, I think it's case by case. I think it also is tied to seniority. I think the more junior you are, the harder it is to really get up and running without being in person, in my opinion. But I think the key to that statement is full time. I think mm -hmm. there, we do have some clients for a variety of reasons that are trying to get people in five days a week and it's just not going well. Um, I think kind of like what Jake was saying, I think the vast majority of people are open to going on site, but do not want it to be on strict terms. Um, mm -hmm. So I'd say, you know, that's that's what we're seeing. To go, I just want to make one point on the, because admit this shows that I'm in recruiting for sure, but I would say what I can tell you long-term about a Google or any other company that does very, very uh, location-based compensation differences, I mean, you're going to open yourself up to head hunting tremendously. I mean, I can mm -hmm. I don't say any names, but I would say there are multiple companies that came out publicly saying we're going to pay you the same. Or I would just go to every region where Google had their comp difference and scoop them right up and give them Bay Area salaries again. It'd be the easiest recruiting project of all time. <laughs> <laughs> it's happening. So yeah, exactly. I, I, I guess that leads uh, leads us to the, the other side um, on the candidate side. Uh, how can candidates really uh, excel in a remote workforce um, and, and make sure that they're collaborating and, and learning and not hiding behind a, a computer screen? Yeah, Kayla, I think that's a great question. This goes to Phil's prior point. So at first, the kind of early research on going remote, and there are some, you know, real strong, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, supporters of this and think that it is the future. The first research said, oh, this is so great. You know, you cut down on commuting. Um, you can work all hours. <laughs> it's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, and so productivity goes up. What we're learning now what it seems at least is that it really varies by seniority, um, as Phil uh, highlighted. That if I didn't you've been even know the job, data was on my side, that's great. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if you've been at your job 20 or 30 years, you've got your connections, right? The social capital, you've developed all that, you're great. You can sit at home, you don't, you know, never have to put on nice pants. Um, but if you are just starting out those connections uh that kind of mentorship that that you know frankly is hard to replicate remotely uh is really crucial and i think that that will in, uh, in will increasingly see this loom large as we go forward that's interesting yeah i mean i i couldn't agree more i think it's uh it makes me worried about five to ten years from now when we have a lot of folks that were brought up remotely mm -hmm. The skills, I just don't think are going to be as strong, honestly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, go ahead, Jake. Yeah, go to, to, go to your uh, question directly, Kayla. Um, 
I, a, I think it's hard uh, if you're just starting out, uh, but you have to do everything you can to kind of forge outreach efforts, to reach out to mentors, to not sit at home and hide behind your computer screen, and to be very cognizant of what you're missing out uh, relative to what you'd have gained in 2017, 2018, before uh, the kind of remote workforce took off. I would actually say, and we've had this, actually a lot of our contractors, we've had to have this conversation with where the bonus of working remotely is wonderful, but it actually puts more onus on you to proactively be getting on your manager's calendar and getting on your teammate's calendar. And, you know, if you go a couple of days or a week with just kind of like doing your own thing and doing your work, you know, that can easily raise some red flags for the people around you. So it's, it's almost like you got to over-engage a little bit, whether that's Slack, whether that's, you know, video meetings, you know, whatever it is, it's, it's kind of on you and it's on your manager, obviously, to make sure they're trying to create that environment as well. But I would say the people that are probably going to excel remotely are the ones that are a little bit more proactive in their communication dynamic. Agreed. Yeah. I mean, we have Slack and Teams and, you know, Zoom and phone calls. So, Bill, what's your best recommendation on being proactive, not having burnout? And I would you know, just say from a management and company perspective, try and pick a platform and stick to it. I think the feedback we get that is negative is it's email, it's Slack, it's Skype, it's Gmail, it's like kind of all over the place. Like try and streamline it. A lot of engineers do a really good job. It's like Slack all day long and like everyone knows it and that's great, but there's definitely companies that are a little bit hodgepodge and I think they struggle the most with the remote stuff. Mm -hmm. So that kind of leads into burnout, right? So how can we make recommendations on setting boundaries on, on both sides? I think this Jake, is, you yeah, take this? I think it's an absolutely crucial question because we're starting to, starting to see uh, various manifestations of burnout. Um, you know, part of this is outside of control of um, tech employers and tech employees. It's, you know, making, it's getting back to more regular schools, uh, school um, schedules for those workers with young children. Uh, and I think it's finally, uh, you know, to get to kind of drill down into the firm, it's on managers to make clear and set kind of boundaries and expectations that there is an expectation that you are keeping up on Slack or uh, checking and responding to email after five o'clock you know that that really has to come i think from the managerial side for especially entry level you know um, employees just in their first second third years they're responding to what the manager's uh expectations are and so that's where i think the onus is at least until we get back to more kind of predictable consistent um work uh, uh, life uh, work-life balance mm -hmm. phil i have a question for you so for for folks that are in hiring roles or management roles, you know, they're kind of new to this whole hybrid remote workforce. What are some tangible ways where they can actually build a remote culture that fosters <laughs> positivity? Yeah, I, think, I think encouraging flexibility is critical because in managing more to results and KPIs or whatever you call them internally, I think, you know, the one thing that I think is so interesting is the difference between being in the office and being at home. And it's so funny because it's the opposite, but in the office, you have natural built-in breaks, water cooler, it's literally a saying, stopping at the water cooler, chatting with your colleagues, walk into the bathroom, you walk down the hall and you chat with a colleague. You know, for us going to visit a client and, and, you know, traveling to that client site, waiting in the lobby, like there are sort of these built in timeouts. And I was actually talking about this at one of our leadership conferences from, for our own company, where it's like, I actually think that's one of the big, like when I'm at home and I'm just cranking away, I mean, I'll go five hours and just like not even realize it. But then like, I'm so tired by the time I realize that like, I haven't stopped one time to like do anything and in the office. That just never really happened because of the way in which you set up your day and your life. And so I just think you'd like throughout the day, whether it's going outside and like literally walking around your house for 10 minutes or like just taking 
a minute to like try and build in some of those natural barriers throughout your day, I just think goes a long way in helping your focus and also just helping you end your day, not feeling just completely drained. So it's hard yeah. to think it's something that I agree. It starts at the leadership level, but it's also kind of personal thought and, and sort of creating a structure to your day that works for you. Have either of you heard of reverse mentorship? This no. is a concept that, um, that I learned about, I don't know, three or four years ago. And it really um, is the reverse of mentorship, right? Where the mentee is kind of mentoring their manager of, of how they want to be led. Um, and so, you know, not micromanaging or maybe setting certain boundaries or saying, hey, I feel a little bit lost. Can we set up a... Uh, once a week sync up, or maybe as a team, everyone's feeling a little bit burnt out. How about we do a, you know, a coffee talk every other week where we can just talk about what, what's going on and have that uh, transparency. So I, I really am a big fan of reverse mentorship and, you know, the individual taking ownership of leading, you know, their higher ups into how they want to be led. Totally. Yeah, I think that's a, uh, a fantastic concept. Obviously, it relies on managers open to it. Uh, and so I, I hope it spreads in the kind of managerial uh, uh, literature as well. Um, I would also say that, you know, uh, especially if you're starting out and you do really want to reach out to your, uh, you know, direct manager about ways in which, you know, to build in breaks, to work through kind of communication channels. Uh, teaming up with other employees could help as well. So it's not just you be, uh, 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 versus a manager one-on-one, -on -one, but that you've got other employees and you're raising a common set of issues um, might go uh, a kind of a longer way. It's a great idea though. Absolutely. So with that, our um, third theme that we want to talk through is navigating the tech talent gap. And I think this is one that uh, is at the top of everyone's mind. Um, I think we have a stat here um, by 2026, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, they estimate that the shortage of technical talent will exceed 1.2 million. So with that, uh, Jake, what are you seeing in terms of numbers and data um, around the talent shortage in tech? Uh, it's a great one. And I'm really eager to hear what uh, both you and Phil have to say about it because you're kind of on the ground uh, and uh, in the nitty gritty here. I will say that um, talent gaps are uh, uh, on, are kind of those headlines screaming that particular industries uh, can't fill the positions that they need uh, come up time and time again. It's very, very difficult to determine when it's real and it's a real issue and that our kind of uh, training, education system really has to kick into gear to help uh, fill that gap, or when it's um, employers uh, failing to adjust for new realities of the labor force. So for example, right now in a lot of industries, you have employers saying, we can't fill, we can't find uh, qualified employees, but they're also at the same time unwilling to increase compensation. So some of the gap has to do with the fact that employers aren't adjusting to the new expectations from potential workers who could fill those positions. Is that happening in tech right now? Is that part of it? Nah, I don't know, because in tech, you do have compensation that is moving upward, right? Uh, and so that the, the talent shortage may in fact be quite real. And that, you know, I think that speaks to kind of broader issues within um, the higher education system where, you know, we've had a real slowdown, especially among uh, men in terms of college uh, enrollment and college completion rates. Uh, and that, you know, raises a whole sort of other kind of questions about how do we kind of train up the next generation of tech workers. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, in terms of the tech talent gap, I mean, it's, it's expected to reach 70% by the, you know, by the end of the year. And, um, you know, 28% of Q2 hiring in tech has increased um, seventy-eight percent up from Q1. So, Phil, what have you seen uh, employers do in terms of narrowing down that gap in order to hire, not just from a you know salaries perspective, but from a skills perspective? I mean, I think that the truth is, 
it's a, it's this is this is such a loaded question because it's there's about a hundred things you could say that need to happen to try and close the tech talent gap, but I think the biggest one is recognizing who's capable of solving your problem, whatever that problem is, with a little bit of mentorship and guidance. I think that's probably the biggest thing, especially you know when you're you're solving a super complicated very large scale problem and you need someone who has sort of really, really strong computer science experience, that's one thing. But for a lot of corporate America where they're, they're not to say they're, the work they're doing is not challenging, but there's a lot of software engineering and engineering jobs that with some guidance and someone who has a reasonably, even a, a good, a reasonable associate's degree or some of these boot camps, whether it's general assembly or some of these other things where they have a foundation. And if they're plugged into the right system, they can probably, first of all, they'll probably stay there for 10 years because they'll be so appreciative that they were given a chance. But um, so I think there's going to be a huge push from a lot of the openings in that sort of, that, that create a lot of that tech talent gap where they're going to have to lower their bar a little bit as far as their must haves and their expectations. Mm -hmm. Also think though, there's like a, there's a whole other political conversation to be had around visas. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of things that can be done on that front to solve some problems pretty quickly because, you know, at a certain point, what you're really talking about is, are we going to figure out how to allow businesses to continue to flourish? Or if the gap gets that big by 2026 and we don't do something about it, there are going to be businesses that just, that just simply fail and do not succeed and go out of business because they can't build the product, which mm -hmm. obviously wouldn't be good for any of us. So um, it's a complicated issue, but it's definitely one that I think everyone's thinking about. And I, I love to see the engineering community give back to a lot of people are, you know, I love, I actually really like a lot of what Google's doing in that online school where you can basically do it for free and learn engineering skills and, I know a lot of engineers that teach at code camps and teach at high schools for computer science and, you know, every little bit counts, but um, I don't think there's going to be a, a silver bullet for this one, unfortunately. So I guess that kind of brings me to the challenge, right? This is the, the biggest pain point in hiring, but it's also hard for, for, uh, you know, techies to be able to keep up with a laundry list of 15 skills that they need to learn, whether it's, you know, different JavaScript frameworks, or now they have to be able to deploy to CIC pipelines and have the cloud experience. So as technology is advancing, the skills list gets higher. You know, are you guys seeing um, different specializations or, um, I mean, what are you, what do you think is going to happen to um, to candidates and not being able to touch everything that employers want? I think that goes back to just hiring on potential. I mean, mm. it's going to have everything you want right now. So what can you get away with and, and what can they learn on the job? You know, that's going to be different in every environment you go into, but that is it's only going to accelerate that issue because more, as the faster new technology comes out and the faster these different topics change, fewer and fewer people are going to be expected to have that experience. So it might actually make it easier to be honest. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we, we talk about the 80, 20 rule, right? So what's the, uh, what does that mean to you, Phil? And what do you think? 80, 20 is way too high. 60, 40. So pack, pack, unpackage that for folks that, that don't know. So, if, and I actually really believe this. If you, sorry, Jake, to steal all the thunder here, but I'm, <laughs> no uh, the, if you hire someone who has 80% of what, if like, let's say a job description is written up and the candidate that you hire has 80% of what you want on the job, they are not going to stay at your job for more than a year or two because they're going to learn that 20% and they're going to get bored and leave. Whereas if you hire someone who has 60% of your, the jobs you need, where they can come in, they can add that value, but they're going to learn 40% of your job description. That person's probably going to stay for four 
for five, six, seven years because A, they appreciate that you gave them the chance to do that learning, but B, first year it's going to be now they're 70, then it's 80, then it's 90, then it's 100. And that's what people want. You know, no one wants to stay at a job where they have 100% of the skills required to be good at it because uh, it's just not good for their long term income potential. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree with everything Phil and uh, Kayla said on this topic. You know, um, again, if you are looking to kind of close uh, uh, talent shortages in tech or any other industry, uh, and this kind of circles back to where we began, I think uh, firms need to readjust and think about their internal training mechanisms or promotion mechanisms, way, you know, job ladders within the firm that are kind of clear and, uh, uh, you know, open and available. You learn these skills within this amount of time, we bump you up to this new uh, position. That's generally speaking, kind of fallen out of the wayside for so many corporations. Uh, and I think that that is one key mechanism in which this gap can be closed. And I'm glad Phil waded into the controversial waters before I did, but in tech in particular, it is hard to talk about uh, talent shortages without talking about the immigration system. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say about that in terms of searching for uh, qualified employees, I think you know it's a new reality and you need to broaden out your search, uh, the search kind of procedures and mechanisms you had in place before. Uh, need to get more intensive and wider and looking into uh, communities where you might not have spent a lot of time recruiting uh, beforehand. And, and as Phil uh, mentioned, you know, not taking wild chances, uh, you still have a business to run and productivity to pay attention to, but uh, being more open to uh, internal training and, and the ability to kind of it's spot talent and then really develop it internally. Yeah, I think that's a great point in, in terms of uh, retention as well and, and giving them the opportunity to learn. Um, do you, either of you have input on what companies are doing in order to provide online learning or, you know, there's no, right now there's no in-class learning opportunities. Have you seen that? The whole industry, literally. Yeah. Corporate learning is, a, is an industry, but I would say it's an old industry that's quickly evolving from what I can tell. Um, and we definitely, you know, there's the Coursera's of the world, there's the edX's of the world, there's, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there, but it's how you embed that into your culture and how do you embed that into how your managers operate on a daily basis, which I think is gonna set people apart, specifically as, as it pertains to tech training, in my opinion, mm -hmm. uh, because it only works unless it only works if it's recognized as something that's valuable internally. I agree. We there's actually a um, a question in the chat about degrees and and you know what are you guys seeing in terms of you know bachelor's degrees or you know that's one thing that uh, depends on on the skill set and what the role type is. But any any input there in terms of whether it's you know, cybersecurity or cloud or engineering, any sort of degree requirements for specific skill sets. Jake, any input on degrees uh, from, know, our, from our yeah. professor? As a, right, as a, as a person not operating in any of these tech firms, uh, you know, I can say that um, we've seen overall degree inflation for some time that uh, job after job that used to require one degree is now requiring a higher, a higher degree. Sometimes that was substantively based. Uh, in many cases, it was a way to winnow uh, the applicant pool. It's an easy cut to say, well, you don't have the uh, required degree. I think that in a, in a, uh, what, a pretty unprecedented uh, era of kind of labor shortages in tech and elsewhere, um, kind of degree inflation uh, needs to go away in a way, and you need to kind of really be able to spot talent beyond the kind of credentials uh, after the applicant's name. That's harder, and obviously that takes more time uh, and intensive search processes, but uh, that's, you know, I think one of the kind of directions uh, employers will have to go uh, in the future. I think that of all the industry, not all the industries, but of a lot of the industries, the tech industry does have a chance to shed some of the degree requirements because it is very easy is the wrong word. It's a logical progression. If you, for example, are in high school and you have been coding your whole life, which honestly, a lot, of, not a lot, a good number of engineers just start young in middle school and 
if you can get a really solid GitHub portfolio together in high school, and you can get a job without going to college, and you can probably get a job at a very good company. I think Google recently just removed all their degree requirements, and a couple of other firms have done something like that as well. But it's it, if you can actually learn it and write really good code, I don't think people care about degrees anymore. It's more so a lot of people that can't write code in high school need to get a computer science degree to be able to write that good code. So it's it's kind of a product of you know our whole entire educational upbringing and how early are we exposing people to these hands-on engineering types of challenges? Um, I don't know the answer to that, but um, I would say there are some things though where you just, for example, I'm knee deep in a lot of uh, machine learning research positions right now. And you kind of have to have a PhD to be able to really play in that arena. Um, I would love to have someone get a job through me that doesn't have a PhD in that arena. It would make my life a lot easier. But, um, you know, there's going to be a certain segment where you just have to have some classical training. But I think we can make some headway on some of the lower level jobs for sure, in my opinion. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'd agree entirely. On the cutting edge, right, those degrees oftentimes really do mean something. But right. that's kind of a drill. You know, once you go further down, it's often just a weeding out mechanism. Yeah. We've seen STEM be promoted within, you know, ed the education system at, you know, elementary and, and middle school and high school levels. It's still taking a long time uh, for, for that to adopt based on, you know, the state and the local. Um, Jake, I, I want to ask you about curriculums, right? Even in for college curriculums, if someone's, you know, pursuing the computer science route and you know a lot of times they're coming out of college and they don't even touch some of the new skill sets and javascript they really just touch java or you know some sql so is there anything you're seeing from the education side in terms of curriculum curriculum adjustments yeah. on a more regular basis I think it's a great question. Uh, having just toured my uh, kindergarten daughter's uh, daughter's new STEM lab at her school, not sure what she'll get out of it, but so there, <laughs> I certainly didn't have that in my kindergarten years. Uh, you know, you uh, at the higher education level, it's a slow moving industry. Um, so I think you are seeing at kind of university after university. I was before I came here about five years ago. I spent eight years as a professor at the University of Washington in Seattle, which was, I think, uh, uh, more on the forefront of some of these, you see kind of cross-disciplinary efforts to promote kind of data science initiatives, certificates, and a lot of, whether it be machine learning, um, uh, kind of data scraping techniques, um, new kind of cutting edge uh, uh, fields uh, that cut across the traditionary kind of balkanized disciplines that us in academia are so used to. Um, these, these are moving slowly. Obviously, the places like Stanford are more ahead of the game uh, than others. But I, I think um, there's a recognition of uh, the need to move in this direction. Um, but it, like everything in higher ed, uh, it doesn't move at the pace uh, that many outside of higher ed would, um, would like it to. I agree. One thing I will so, say, Kayla, just to, I think, yeah tie two quick points together. You were saying all these new technologies that are coming out and how are people gonna stay up to date and learn them? Mm -hmm. The way that the top computer science degrees and even most of the good computer science degrees, the way they think about it is if you learn the right data structure, algorithm, sort of baseline fundamentals, you can learn any of those tools and any of those languages as you need to. So it's less about Java and SQL, and it's more about, do you understand how this all works under the hood? And then you can layer on whatever skills you need to on top of that. Obviously, that's more true for some than others, but um, that would be, I think, what you'd hear a lot of CS professors probably say to you. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned earlier in our discussion that a lot of uh, graduates coming out of school are, you know, no longer at 80K, they're making higher. So what are you seeing with those, those recent grads? Are they doing internships? Are they you know, doing side projects? Um, what kind of uh, 
preparation are they doing to get real experience outside of just school? I would say both of those things, 100% internships. I would say they got a probably a very strong GitHub. But just showing an interest in not just doing it because it was your major, but actually you actually enjoy what you're doing and you're passionate about it, whether that's an internship, whether that's a side project. A lot of uh, computer science grads will, you know, whatever, start their own website or start their own app or, you know, do something to show their they're, they want to get their name out there. But yes, 100%, I would say, commonly internships are, are a great way to set yourself apart. I really think that, I mean, there's, I'm sure there's stats out there, but um, internships have decreased over the past year um, with organizations really being business, uh, you know, just trying to keep the lights on. So um, what are what do you have to say, Jake, to tech leaders who don't necessarily have a, a current internship program, what can they do in order to help with that future workforce? Yeah. Yeah. First, I would say, you know, this is a kind of a practice, I think, probably more deeply institutionalized than other uh, professional industries. You know, if you look at finance, law to an extent, too, um, they have summer training programs, you know, so, so that by the time they've kind of picked uh, their future employees by the time they arrive at the firm, they have gained real on the job experience outside of the classroom. Uh, and so I think that that, you know, I think that's probably imperative for a lot of uh, tech firms as, as well uh, to kind of create those uh, programs. And, you know, it's not gonna be perfect because obviously the students are still in school for nine months out of the year, uh, but whether it's an internship, whether it's a kind of summer training institute, uh, whether it's an actual summer job, uh, where you know they gain some uh, actual real uh, relevant skills at the firm. Um, all of those are kind of um, pipeline development strategies that uh, seem to work well in other professional industries that I think are easily replicated. So we have five minutes left. So I'd like to touch on um, the the future of uh, tech employment in 2022, and then get into some of the audience questions with the five minutes we have left. So. Um, in terms of projections for 2022, Jake, what are you seeing as some of the, the biggest key points to be aware of? <laughs> wow. Uh, so uh, predicting the future, we uh, academics like to do, and we often get it wrong. Uh, no one saw uh, 2020 coming, um, uh, certainly not well in advance. Uh, right now, if we kind of extrapolate from uh, existing trends, we'll have ex continuing tight labor markets, uh, continuing high demand um, from tech firms for employment. I mean, things I think, you know, if you can kind of abstract away from all the outside uh, worries um, that if we kind of continue the 2021 trends uh, into 2022, I think it's a, you know, it's a really exciting time from both the employer and the employee side within tech. This is not true in other industries, but uh, that, uh, that I think should give um, a real boost to uh, those people uh, listening in who are just starting off. And for uh, firms out there, you know, one of the, I think, wonderful things about a kind of growing industry in which firms are doing quite well is that you can afford, in many cases, uh, pay increases. You know, you can kind of meet employees' uh, uh, needs and know that your firm is not in any serious danger. That's some great points. Phil, do you have anything to add to the, the hottest uh, topics in debate for 2022? I think 2022 is going to be such an interesting year. And it's so funny because tech people, tech employees, senior and, you know, more tenured as well as junior, it's kind of like the balls in your court can you prove that this remote workforce thing is going to work long term? I think a lot of executives, and we're already seeing that turnover rate is spiking quite a bit. It's still it's still at a level that I think is palatable for a lot of executives. But if a, if the trend continues where the tech the the tenure of tech employees gets to like sub a year, that's going to be be a big issue that I think it's going to draw people back to wanting people in the office. So I think 22 and two is going to be about, do we start to see it stabilize a little bit where, where folks are respecting the fact that they took a job and they're staying there for 
a reasonable period of time. We'll see. I don't know. It's a lot easier to quit your job right now than it ever has been. So um, I think 20, that's, I think that is going to be a huge data point that is tracked for a long time in 2022. Absolutely. So um, we are at our time, but I just want to pull another question from the audience. So do you guys remember the dot-com boom when a lot of tech roles went offshore? We've been seeing a flood of um, roles go from offshore to onshore, which is also exag exaggerating the um, employment shortage in the U.S. Any final predictions for what's going to happen? in 2022 in terms of the global uh, tech scale? I think it's a great question. It's something uh, you know that is in the background as a concern. I think for the short term, uh, growth will continue to be strong. That the kind of um, uh, uh, tech firms anchored here, uh, you know, from afar at least, show every sign uh, that they are uh, they are uh, demanding a workforce uh, that's U.S. based. Obviously, there are offshore roles, uh, but that that kind of move that move, if you go back to the dot com bust, was sparked by a massive shock to the entire industry, a negative shock, uh, and uh, and there you know everyone was in search of cost cutting mechanisms, and that proved to be one of them. Uh, we're not there, luckily, uh, right now, and uh, with any luck, we won't be there in the coming year. Yeah, I have clients who are bringing 500 roles from offshore to onshore. So I'm really seeing that on the ground level. Phil, any final um, notes to add to the global tech shortage scale? Come on back. We'd love to have you. <laughs> Awesome. So with that being said, um, to wrap things up, one of the resources that we are excited to share with everyone today um, is our 2022 Tech Salary Guide. So that will be launching mid-October, um, which is just a few weeks away. So um, please sign up to receive that. You can get a first look of when it gets rolled out. That will dive into uh, to compensation per just you know each skill set, not just at the high level. So whether you're a candidate, you're looking for new opportunities or you're hiring, this is a very valuable guide. Um, so you have some sort of baseline to work off of. So Emma, is there anything you wanted to add? That's it. Thank you guys so much for joining our panel today. That was, that was such a rich conversation. I feel like we could keep going all day. Um, so I know all of you really enjoyed that conversation. I could tell by the chat. There's just so much we could go into. Um, I'm sure our panelists would love to pick this conversation up with you offline. So feel free to connect with them on LinkedIn. I'm sure they would be happy to connect with you and hear from you. Um, and that's it. Thank you all for joining today. And we hope to see you at our next event next month, which is actually the Timmy Awards, where we will be celebrating the best in tech. We're actually um, announcing our national finalists and next week. So we'd love to see you all there and have a wonderful rest of your week. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.